for the introduction. What a great, uh, what a great service you have here for everyone. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen. That. Okay. Uh, can you see it? Can you see my screen? Uh, orange cover. Yes. Yep. Yes. Excellent. Thank you for that. Okay, folks, here we go. Um, nice to nice you to join today. We're going to talk about the ABCs of real estate investment trusts or what they call REITs. Um, we're going to go ahead and uh, go through about 15 minutes or so of uh, content. And then I'll ask you to, um, uh, and then I'll open up for a few questions. I'll have uh, Nancy monitor the chat. So uh, Nancy, so please, uh, any questions you have, uh, put them in the chat. She'll look at them and, and prioritize them and synthesize them. And we'll take a few and then we'll take a few more 10 minutes later and then we'll take some at the very end. So I'm looking forward to that. I think that's probably the, the best part of the presentation is being able to answer your questions. Okay, here's our disclosures. I won't read this, but it just basically says this is educational. So whatever you'd like to think about doing or uh, want to do, you should check with your own uh, certified financial planner, your tax person, your attorney. Um, you want to go and make sure that it's appropriate for you. Okay, and here's our agenda today. We're going to talk about a couple of different things. First, we're going to go over the basics on REITs so that we're all on the same page. Uh, second, we're going to talk about the numbers, really kind of a case for adding REITs to an overall portfolio. Uh, then we're going to talk about the pros and cons a, a bit then go into a, a case study of uh, an actual real estate investment trust. We'll redact the name uh, of that trust, but I uh, want to show you how that works. And then we're, we're going to give examples of three potential buyers of REITs, and we'll take your questions at the very end. Okay, so the first question is, what is a REIT? And first of all, a REIT is managed by a management team, an investment management team of professionals with lots of experience in commercial real estate. So right away, when I say the word commercial real estate, um, it includes things like apartment complexes, office buildings, warehouses, industrial, that sort of thing, uh, retail uh, specialty. Uh, commercial real estate generally does not include um, uh, single family properties, fourplexes, that sort of thing. That's where the distinction is. Uh, that would be, well, those could be investment real estate properties. Those aren't, uh, those aren't defined as commercial real estate. Uh, so there's a pool of managers uh, in any fund that actually um, manages them and, and they're uh, typically very experienced, long tenures. Uh, they can be either available publicly, uh, which means that they can be purchased from the stock exchange. You can open up a Schwab, E-Trade, something like that or work with your a financial advisor and uh, purchase through that. Or they can be private, which means that they're not available through a uh, purchase of a, a stock symbol. They are, they, the, each REIT includes each uh, uh, commercial REIT uh, that's publicly available, includes thousands of investors. So it's just not you and your roommate or uh, you and your family member investing, but these are uh, these are lots of folks that you've never met before. That's not a bad thing. They're all contributing the same thing. They're all contributing money. And this money goes into a fund that raises enough money to go out there and purchase uh, commercial properties. So that's what that means in terms of having lots of investors there. Uh, the portfolios are diversified. A couple of different things about that. One is that they don't just buy one or two or three properties, but REITs tend to buy dozens or hundreds of properties. And the value of these properties as an aggregate are generally about half a billion to a billion or more dollars. So there's a lot of real estate here at play. And so in that way, because they invest different, uh, in different properties in different parts of the country or even the world, they are diversified geographically. And then finally, there are very low minimums. So we're talking about billions of dollars. We're talking about thousands of investors. We're talking about lots of skilled managers. But in the very end, for investors, um, the minimums to be involved in a REIT can be as small as $2,000 or $5,000, or even for some of the ones that are traded $1,000. So uh, they're actually within reach. You don't have to have hundreds of thousands of dollars in equity to invest in a real estate trust anymore. 
um, you can do it with a few thousand dollars or even money in your IRA account. Okay, so let me give you a little bit of a, an outline of what the timeline is for REITs. Back in 1960, Congress said, yes, the REIT structure can exist. So that was about 61 years ago, and they allowed the use of REITs, um, the aggregation of uh, properties to be sold to the public uh, for investment purposes. Then in 61, uh, you saw the very first community shopping center REITs and shopping mall REITs. That was early on. In uh, 1971, that's when you began to see the rise of apartment and warehouse uh, REITs and distribution facilities. It was way back in 71. Go to 86, self-storage, actually from 86 for a couple, couple of years. That was quite a hot commodity there, uh, self-storage REITs. Again, real estate investment trusts. 88, we have suburban office parks uh, that uh, came onto the REIT uh, scene. In 2001, gasoline stations. You, there are REITs for gasoline stations. Basically, if you can think of a property type in commercial real estate, uh, there's probably a REIT for that. In 2004, data centers. That makes total sense uh, given the rise of the uh, uh, internet and, and uh, e-commerce. Uh, 2012, pipelines and single family uh, rentals. That's when those REITs uh, came um, on the scene. And then finally, the last example is electric, electric transmission lines in 2015. So you can actually buy a REIT for that. So, and then there's lots of other ones that we didn't cover, the movie theaters, the banks, the life science buildings and so on. But like I said, Chances are if there's an asset class that you like, there's probably a REIT that addresses that asset class. Okay, so now we're gonna divide this up a little bit, a little bit technical here. I'll try to make it simple and I'll encourage your questions definitely at the, uh, in a few minutes. But there are two different types of REITs. One is a traded REIT, which means that people like us, you and I can access these by putting our dollars into the fund. And then there's non-traded REITs. Um, so, a traded REIT is, which is the same thing, except they're not on the open market. So for example, a traded REIT is listed on the open market. And what that means is that you can actually see it. Uh, you can go to Yahoo Finance or anywhere else. You put in the symbol numbers, you look at it by the name of it, and you'll get the symbol numbers. And it's actually traded and it's available for trade daily uh, on the business day. And you can get out of it on a, uh, when you want. So in that way, it's liquid. There's liquidity. If you need the money, uh, you can go ahead and within three or four days, you'll be out of that fund. Uh, there's control because you have a chance to go and get in when you want and you can get out when you want. You have control over that investment. Now, what you don't have control over is what the performance is by the time between the time you get in and out, but you do have control over when you take your funds uh, and decide to move them. They have daily share values. So at the end of every trading day, you'll see what the end of the day value is and you can mark it every single day if you want. Not a good idea to look at uh, your investments every day, but you can if you want uh, with these traded REITs. And then finally, there's less restrictions because they're more liquid and they're more visible. Uh, the non-traded REITs, you can invest in those too, but the difference is that, and there, there's, good, there's pros and cons to them, but the difference is that they're not listed. So you won't be able to look up their ticker symbol. It doesn't mean it's bad because you can't find it. It just means that it's private. It's non-traded. So um, you would just, uh, it's um, on the one hand, it's it, you can't see it every day. And on the other hand, it's actually more transparent than traded because with traded REITs, you normally don't get to see all the investment positions that you're in. But with the um, non-traded, they actually will give you a list, typically a list of every single property, purchase price, cash flows, and the whole bit. They're illiquid, so there's generally a holding period. And the holding period lasts anywhere from three years to nine years. Depends on the fund perspectives and prospectus and what they hope to accomplish uh, with their holding period. They're more tax efficient. I'll give you an example of that later, but you can actually get a uh, after-tax yield that's greater than many other investments because they do uh, allow for you to be able to take advantage of the, the tax efficiency of real estate. Uh, they are less volatile because they're not traded every day and because the prices don't change every day. There is volatility in them, but it doesn't happen until the entire fund is valued. Uh, there are higher, typically higher dividend rates 
and there are various exit options. Uh, they can actually, at the end of the um, non-traded REIT period, they can go public uh, and have his, have his own IPO. They can sell their properties out uh, at chunks at a time or one at a time, or they can merge with, the, with another REIT. So that's typically what the exit options are for traded uh, for non-traded REITs. So we're gonna dig into the last technical part here, um, private versus public. A lot of things that you might hear about regarding uh, small family or small group investments are really private. So they're not really available for the public to buy into. Uh, these are typically individuals, regulation D offerings, uh, group offerings, you know, private investors, that sort of thing. Um, so those are private investments, not open to the public. What we're gonna focus more on is we're gonna focus more on the public offerings and all the public offerings uh, are SEC registered. So that means there's some sort of oversight. Uh, there's regulation to this. And that brings some people a little bit more uh, peace of mind that there's somebody overlooking the entire process and uh, perhaps uh, the um, you know, funds are held accountable to a much greater extent than they are on the private side. So there are the trader REITs we talked about. We just mentioned a little bit about those earlier, uh, where those are liquid. There are the non-traded ones where they're illiquid, but they have other features on them that are beneficial to some investors. And then there's something called the interval fund, which is kind of a hybrid. It is like a non-traded REIT. You get the benefits of you know the steadiness, the cash flow, the tax advantage, but you also get the flexibility to, to get out of that interval fund on a monthly basis, as opposed to holding three to nine years. So keep that in mind. Um, there's a kind of a, a fund right in the middle of the two, the traded and the non-traded, that, uh, that might be suitable, might hit the spot for, for some investors. Okay, so the typical life cycle of a REIT is that they raise money. So in the very, say the very first third of his life cycle, they're raising money from people like you and I. They're typically doing this through the uh, different platforms uh, or the advisors that they work with um, that they're approved to offer their, their properties or fund to. Then they take it to, after they've done, after they're done uh, raising money, they stop the raise. And then they spend a number of years stabilizing the, the assets. And what stabilizing the assets means is that they are taking what they have purchased and they're trying to improve in them or strengthen them. So for example, they might've purchased a building with an uh, occupancy of 85% and perhaps the target on that is 93%. And that's what they're working to do. They're looking to increase rents over time. Uh, when inflation happens and the cost of uh, goods increases, it's typically that uh, real estate follows. So when you increase rents because people are paid and uh, I guess um, uh, they are rewarded when the value and the uh, income increases over time, it increases uh, the share value when re rents increase. So um, they're stabilized, they're working hard to stabilize these properties and make them into a nice exit for the investor. Now I'm talking about the non-traded REITs, the ones what they hold for three to, to, to nine years. And then the third uh, uh, part of the cycles, and then they sell a portfolio. And one of the three areas or three ways that I mentioned earlier. Okay. So we're gonna talk about numbers now for a little bit and then I'll take a few questions. <clears throat> and you wanna get your questions into Nancy, put them in the chat um, and she'll look at them. And we wanna to stick to questions on things that we've been talking about so far, because there's probably some other things that you might have questions on that we'll cover in a few minutes. Okay, so let's take a look at the numbers. This chart is interesting. Uh, this is a chart by, put together by JP Morgan. And what they've done is they source the return rates of a variety of different types of investments over a 20 year period. The 20 year period uh, ended on December, 2019. So it's fairly recent, not exactly till last year, but fairly recent, but it goes back to 99. So when you take a look at all of the different investments here on this bar chart, you see REITs, uh, you see gold, the S&P 500 uh, exchange, 60-40 means 60% stocks, 40% bonds. And the 40-60 is a flip of that. Uh, so you'll see all these asset classes. This has been, these are measured over a 20-year period. So what that means is, for example, with real estate, um, it, it considers um, 
the uh, bust of residential real estate, which is not necessarily commercial, but in 2008 um, and, uh, and the rise of real estate before that, and considers the, the drop of the, uh, what, uh, the dot-com bust back in the early 2000s and the other drop in 2008. So this covers a lot of period, uh, a long period of time. So if you look at it uh, in the last 20 years, and so this is a really cherry pick. This is not in the last three or five years. REITs have done really well in terms of return rate. Um, gold has done good. The stock market has done okay too. Uh, some people are surprised at 6.1. Some people thought it would be less, some people more. Uh, take a look at, um, at uh, homes, by the way. At homes at homes are, are defined as places where people live. Uh, in other words, they're not investment properties. They're lifestyle assets, uh, places you purchase or you rent. The uh, appreciation for homes has been 3.4% over that time. Uh, inflation has been 2.2. And, and by the way, the average investor has been just under 2%. Um, a little bit disappointing to see that. Uh, the reason for that is, is generally the investor chases what is hot and what is hot generally drops over time. Uh, what is actually not performing well generally increases over time typically. So when somebody chases something that's, that's kind of hot uh, or on top, they're probably in for a decline uh, coming forward. That's just the way that worked. And that's an actual number. That's a, a not a good number, but that's a, a, a number that, uh, that has uh, been verified. So REITs have done a good job. Even if I throw in last year, if I just speculate a little bit on last year, um, this REITs performed, the trade REITs performed like the stock market. So they probably have maintained or, you know, their 11% uh, return rate on an average for 21 years, if I had to just guess on that. Um, the non-trader REITs, some of them did fine, some of them hurt, but it's not over yet because they're still going through their cycles. So, uh, and of course, uh, uh, remarkably, the stock market did well, the bond market not so well last year. So, but still, this is a 20 year average. So even if you add last year into this, you won't get much more of a difference. All right. So this is looking backwards, not looking forward, but I thought it was interesting to show you what the, that REITs actually do a pretty decent job in terms of return for investors. Okay, let's talk about what tax advantage means. Because I know this is a question that comes up often. I, I teach a class at UC Berkeley Extension. It's on real estate investing. And um, we hold it in San Francisco or recently on Zoom. And so I know people really want to know about this. So I'm going to try to make quick work on this here. Uh, we're going to make an assumption of a $100,000 investment for a moment. And we're going to go ahead and assume that that investment produces a 6% return rate. All right. Now, and real estate on non-traded real estate and also real estate they hold directly that's an investment property, you can depreciate that property over time. You can also write off the mortgage interest. So let's assume for right now, and this is not uh, outrageous, but let's assume that I am able to, to deduct 50% uh, of the income thanks to depreciation and mortgage interest. Okay. And also there's something new a couple of years to call qualified business income that I can deduct 20% uh, off from the very top. So that's another tax benefit for uh, most of the REITs out there. And then there's the, let's say, assume that uh, we're in the 35% tax brackets together. All right, so that's the assumptions that we wanna make. Let's see what happens with those assumptions if we invest in a note. A note is uh, basically taking back a, a note from somebody, you lend them $100,000 and they pay you 6% a year. That's what that is. So on a pre-tax yield, you get your 6%, which means that you get $6,000, which isn't too bad. But there's no write-off because notes are all ordinary income tax. There's no tax benefits to that. So your taxable distribution is still 6%. There's no QBI deduction or credit for that either. So it's still 6% of 100,000, so $6,000. So your taxable net, net taxable distribution is $6,000. We're at the 35% tax bracket. That means that the... Uh, um, government keeps uh, $2,100, right? That means we get to keep in our pocket after that $6,000, $3,900. This is really important because people really want, it's really about what you keep at the very end of your investment, not necessarily what you make on a gross basis. Okay, so, and we're at the 35% tax brackets. So our effective tax on this investment was 35% because there's no deductions or no uh, 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 tax advantage. 
And that means our yield, our actual yield was not 6% on this investment, but it was 3.9%. So much less than six, but it's par for the course given you know the assumption that I laid out here. Let's say that you put that $100,000 into a REIT. You get that same 6% assumption that we made. Uh, the distribution then is $6,000, but then we get to write off half of that for, uh, for tax write-offs. So that means we're only taxed on $3,000 of that so far. And then we get 20% of that QBI credit too for most REITs that most REITs get. So that means you save another $600 in taxable income. That means that your net net taxable distribution is $2,400. You take 35% off of that and the tax is only 840 compared to 2100. You get to keep $5,160. That means that your average tax rate for that investment was 14%. Uh, well less than the 35% on the note or a similar investment. And that means that your after-tax yield, after you pay taxes, is 5.15%. So you can see why a directly held real estate, real estate investment trust with uh, tax advantages like this, you can see why uh, people love the tax advantage uh, of, of real estate. And by the way, to get the same 5.15% uh, after-tax yield, on my note, I would actually have to yank that up to about a seven, almost an 8% pre-tax yield or uh, interest rate, which is hard to do because people won't pay more than they have to pay. So it gives you an idea what the tax advantage is of REITs. Okay, pros and cons. Why are REITs so popular? One is diversification. Uh, it allows you to diversify your portfolio from not just stocks and bonds, uh, to stocks, bonds, and perhaps real estate. So here's an example of that. Now, there's two circles here. I'm going to ask you to focus on the first one. The first one is a circle, um, a chart that represents 60% stocks and 40% bonds. Well, during a 20-year period, the same one we talked about earlier, ending 2019, so 20 years is a good period of time, the return rate for a 60-40 portfolio stock bond was 5.71% and the volatility rate was 7.1. Now, I, I don't wanna go into a big explanation on volatility and what this number means, um, but I will say that the lower the volatility number, the lower the volatility of that portfolio is. So you really want a lower number and 7.1 .7 is not a terrible number, but um, uh, still it's 5.7 return rate with a 7.1 volatility rate. If I simply added during that same time, 10% commercial real estate REITs in there, right? Then I would have come up with a return rate that is 30 basis points higher, 6% than the other uh, 60, 40. And I would, my volatility would have dropped by about uh, to 6.4% instead of 7.1. Now remember, we want more, less volatility, we want a lower number. So you can see just by adding 10% REITs in there, uh, during that same period of time, it would have improved performance and reduced volatility, which most people uh, seek from their investments. Okay, a few more, then we'll take a few questions. It's non-correlated. And what non-correlation means is that when, what non-correlation means, excuse me, is that when the stocks go up, uh, it doesn't mean that the REITs will follow. Or when the stocks drop, it doesn't mean that the REITs will follow. So in that regard, they're non-correlated. Just because you hear the stock market news and it's one, uh, it's a big news, uh, increase or decrease one day, doesn't mean that REITs will follow. So it gives people a little bit of way to, to um, average out their risk reward experience. Okay, uh, these are institutional real estate uh, investments. These are big buildings, uh, typically 10, 15, $20 million buildings, $50 million buildings. It's the stuff that you see when you want when you go into San Francisco or Oakland or San Jose and the things that you can't imagine owning. And by being part of a REIT structure, you might own a, a brick of that, perhaps. Um, and you're on the board with that. Um, it's passive income. And in my experience, that's really what most people want. They What they really want real estate for is they want it to generate income for themselves and their families and want to be passive and they want to allow them to work less and relax more. Uh, and that's really what the, the main thing is. Now it's passive and it's tax advantage. And by the way, it's not correlated to the stock market. Boy, that's great. Um, it, they're low minimums. Um, that's why they're popular. Um, even somebody though with $200,000 of 
of equity who would otherwise invest in a, a property on their own, they may not want the hassle of the management. Uh, they want may want something more passive and already generating income where they don't have to worry about all the other stuff, especially in the last year where we saw landlords really had to compromise a lot with you know, what they could do with tenants and what they could do to collect rents and so on. If you're the actual investor in that, it was probably a challenge for you. It was a challenge for the renter and it was also a challenge for the investor. And then also people love real estate. Uh, I mean, they, they people cannot get enough of it. Uh, when real estate is going well, people love it. When real estate is going poorly, people see opportunity. It's not the same with stocks where people's, the market goes down, people get scared and they want to sell. Uh, when real estate, they see opportunity there. So people love real estate. So Nancy, I think we'll, I think we'll open it up here and we'll take some questions and see, see what we've got. Okay. Well, the first uh, question is, um, are REITs audited by a certified public accountant, a third party? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, the uh, so the, remember, there's two different types of REITs. One is the private ones, and the other ones are the public ones. The public ones are, uh, but uh, the 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 range of quality of the REITs are great. So you want to stick to the higher quality REITs that do have third party auditing, and they do make these uh, reports available on a regular basis. That do have to report to the SEC, and also are accountable uh, to the financial regulatory uh, organization called FINRA. So yes, uh, they can be not necessarily on the private side, but on the ones we've been talking about, yes. But you still wanna go ahead and do more research and make sure that they're on the higher end side so that you're getting the benefit of all of that um, uh, due diligence and that reporting. Great question. Great. Um, on, on your slide where you, it says how do REITs perform, the one with uh, REITs, gold, and the S&P 500, what does EAFE stand for? Oh, that's a foreign stock exchange. That's a symbol for uh, uh, non-domestic or non-US uh, stocks. Okay. Um, and this question, I'm not sure I completely understand, but with the QBI deduction, is that, they're asking, is that for active managers or passive investors? Yep, it has nothing to do with either of that. It has to do with the structure of the investment itself or a QBI is also good for some professions. Uh, some business owners um, uh, can take QBI. I think like, I, I think real estate investors are a good example of uh, real estate brokers are one, um, CPAs. Um, a lot of business cause, can take the QBI deduction, but many of the REITs can take it as well. Okay, excellent so, mm -hmm. questions here. Um, and another one, how do REITs uh, go up and down in value um, with inflation? How does inflation affect them? Typically, uh, so I can't speak universally for all the REITs, but typically uh, inflation is good for real estate and REITs. The reason is, is because when there's inflation, that means there's increased increased cost of goods. Whereas when there's an increased cost of goods, it means that the uh, landlords uh, need to increase their rents. So that's what happens. Everything goes up and that includes real estate. Real estate is right there with the rest of everything else. And it's counted as part of that cost of living index too. So it's um, in inflation. Inflation is not great for everybody, but for REITs and REIT investors, it's generally good news. So we'll take one more and then we'll go back to the presentations. Okay. Um Actually, there's two similar ones, but someone said, if Amazon is successful in taking over brick and mortar retail, would that hurt REITs? And is the working from home trend affect affecting REITs? Okay, gosh, great questions. I love those questions. So Amazon, you know, um, if they're successful, the brick and mortar, which means that they go more on retail and they're more in our local neighborhood rather than entirely on our front doorstep is what that means. Um, they don't own a lot of the properties that they use. So it is, uh, so for example, um, I'm here in Pleasanton, I'm here in San Ramon, and uh, the Stone Ridge Mall is having, is struggling, keeping their doors, a couple of retailers in there. Amazon is working out, and it was not Amazon, it could be anyone else working out, uh, where they take over some of the major space there and be able to use it as an outlet. So actually Amazon might actually save that shopping center. Uh, it's actually more of a shopping mall. 
So Amazon could do, do very well in that. And a couple of the reasons that we offer, and many of them, Amazon, especially the warehouse rates, Amazon is a major tenant. So, uh, and the reason is they rather lease than own because it's off their books and they're not too real estate heavy. You know, they're not a real estate company. Um, regarding the second thing with COVID um, and the uh, how, I think the question is essentially how it's changed uh, rates. Some REITs really did very well and some REITs didn't do so well. So I think you'll, I think uh, the uh, uh, person asking this question will, will follow this. Uh, uh, the, the REIT the category that didn't do very well is hospitality. Hospitality is basically hotel uh, resorts, that sort of thing. Those hurt. Uh, I mean, they had a drop of about 40, 50% in value uh, as well as a corresponding drop of income. Now, so now they're stabilized. Some of them had to go out of business. So they're not, when they're REITs, that means they have lots of them. They, they, the REIT doesn't go out of business. It's just some of their properties might not do well. Uh, I haven't heard of any uh, hospitality REITs uh, doing terribly, but I have heard of people who own um, a hotel space doing poorly uh, because of that, but they're not part of a restructure. So it does, that's one. The other one is medical uh, centers and facilities, especially uh, um, elder care. Those REITs didn't do as well because that was a scary place to be in the last 12 months. On the other hand, and office did actually pretty decently. Office is still kicking out income because the REITs buy office buildings with large tenants that guarantee, that basically are required to pay no matter who shows up, shows up to the office or not. So the office REITs actually didn't do so bad and warehouse REITs really took a rise. They did, uh, there's not enough of them out there. Uh, they can't build them fast enough. So it depends on which, you know, which category. I think the, the opportunity is, is to be part of a mix of different types of REITs. There's funds out there, REITs that actually go into different areas like, uh, you know, data centers and uh, power lines and that, you know, all these different types of things and they mitigate their loss by being in, involved in any one uh, category. Great questions. Okay, we're gonna come back to this in a few minutes here. Let's get back to our regular programming. Oops. There we go. Okay. Nancy, can you see the slide? Not yet. Okay. Do this again. There we go. Okay. How does go. that look? Okay. Thank you. Okay, so on we go. What are the primary risks? And this is something that's really important to think about. Uh, people always underestimate risk. Um, and they're so eager to do something that they don't think about that. So to pay attention to some of these here, uh, not uh, real estate trusts or any sort of real estate investment is not suitable to all investors. It, sometimes you just don't have enough money to make it happen. Sometimes you got to pay the bills and keep the lights on. Uh, sometimes it's better to be boring for a while uh, and just be stable. Um, so it's not suitable for everybody. Uh, there's never a guaranteed performance. Uh, anything that's invested, anything that's not in cash is an investment. Anything that's investment is speculative. So there's certainly no guaranteed performance. Um, upon liquidation of a REIT, you might actually end up with less than you started out with. So there's that possibility. There's a possibility of loss. Uh, there's limited liqui liquidity with non-traded REITs. You're relying on, on fund managers to make the selection for you. Um, I think for most people in general, it's better to have an expert do it for you than not. But, you know, just something to know that you're relying on that manager, that team. And there's various economic factors that can play uh, into the performance. Interest rates, um, legislative risk, which is law. You know, um, well, how will they change the laws to, to change the benefit of the investment that I bond? Operating expenses, insurance costs, tenant turnover, that sort of thing. Okay. So those are good risks to consider. Um, typically, the a question is in this sort of uh, format, you know, then what should I be looking for uh, when I think about a real estate investment trusts? And what I put together here is a page of considerations. And I broke them down by types, investment objectives, uh, portfolio statistics, distribution, taxation, and debt and leverage. 
So this is a really good starting point. I think that if you went through and, and understood most of this about the investment you're making, you are much better informed than most investors when they decide to make this sort of investment. Okay, so I hope that you can use this chart. By the way, uh, the, the uh, slides are available to you. I think there's a recording that'll be uh, posted as well. So you're welcome to revisit this uh, if you like. Uh, my email address is at the bottom. Um, so if you have questions, um, if there's something like some sort of direction I can provide, um, I'm up for a, a, a quick uh, a message like that. So feel free to reach out to me. Okay, so we're gonna talk about a real estate example here uh, called a REIT story. And we're gonna use a case for a warehouse and industrial. So what I consider, uh, what most people consider, um, the most boring asset, uh, real estate asset class out there or property type. Uh, apartments are in interesting, uh, office buildings, retail, there's, they're vibrant. These things you drive by on the highway. <laughs> so most people don't get really excited about owning an industrial warehouse, right? But I wanna I want to make a case for why it's not a bad thing to consider, all right? First of all, look at the increase in population over time. So I've got it from 2015 to projected 2045. Now, right now, what, 2021, uh, it's a, we have about, what, 330, 335 million people in, the, in, in America. Okay, it's expected to get to three hundred almost 60,000 by 2030 and by 389,000 by 2045. That is a huge increase in population here. One person is gained every 14 seconds. That's quite remarkable. Okay, so the case for warehouses, one is the population growth. Population growth is very big. The second is that, uh, whoops, with the uh, increase in population and the increase in our individuality here, because we all want something that's unique or different for us, they have a lot more SKUs, what's called stock keeping units. So whenever you see a barcode, and you see a, 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 a shampoo that's one type, but it's in four different sizes. Those are four different SKUs, right? And you multiply that by the type of shampoo and damage, non-damage, whatever you like, all the toothpaste out there, uh, everyone's got a SKU. So there's more and more of these being uh, created, not less. So when you have more SKUs, that means you have more products, that means you have, need more space. There's global manufacturing. I mean, we're trading more than ever before. And then there's finally e-commerce uh, revolution. And that means that more things are ending up at our doorstep than ever before as well, especially in the last year. Combination of all these things uh, make a great case for why more warehouses will be needed in the future. Here's the actual role of a warehouse in the life cycle of a product. And we're gonna use toothpaste for a moment, all right? So, Here's if, if you, um, I'll, I'll read this uh, through with you. I'll kind of skip through it a bit. But warehouse, distribution warehouse number one, this is where all the raw material goes before it's brought together to make the toothpaste. So there's, there are different warehouses all around the world. And then, the, then they're brought together in the second, uh, second panel here, and they're manufactured somewhere. Let's assume that's not a warehouse for a moment. And then they're done with manufacturing and they ship them out to another warehouse, all done in these big boxes ready to be shipped out, okay? Then it goes to warehouse number th uh, three in this cycle. And that generally is a warehouse somewhere in the region where it's like a stop before it gets parted out. And then warehouse number four is closer to your home. And warehouse number five is the last place at the Safeway or Walmart or even it ends up on your doorstep, that's the last, that's the point of sale. So in this, not including the manufacturing, uh, there's four warehouses being used for a, a tube of toothpaste, all right? So that's just for toothpaste, by the way, it's not for, it's, that doesn't include all the other things out there. Let's see, so that's the case for warehouses. Um, I will tell you this, I will add this, um, that since I really started focusing on uh, real estate and financial planning over the last 16 years, warehouses have been probably, <clears throat> according to um, Price Waterhouse Cooper, um, they have been in the slightly higher than average return rate for
for commercial properties, and slightly lower than average volatility or risk rate for commercial properties. So they've been in that nice quadrant there for the entire time, pretty much. Um, so something to think about. Um, just because it is boring doesn't mean that it's not a good thing to think about. Finally, we're going to go into three examples of REIT buyers, and I'll try to make this quick so I can take questions here, because I know we're about 15 minutes away from being done. REIT investor number one. Okay. Mort and Betty Gage. They're retirement bound. All right. So let's see what their situation is. They are uh, retiring. They have an interest in real estate investing. Uh, they have income needs in their retirement of $95,000. And their Social Security is going to take care of $60,000 of that. So what that means is that they have an income gap that they didn't have before retirement of $35,000. So the question is, how do we solve this gap? Well, just to give you some more background. They have cash of $150,000. They have investment accounts of $700,000 and our, account, uh, our accounts of $500,000. That's what they've got. So here's one approach. There's different things. There's different things to consider. Um, you know, but uh, here's one approach. They invest $100,000 each in two tax advantage REITs. Right? One is a triple net REIT which triple net means simply that there's not a lot of expenses uh, that generate a 6% yield. And because there's 6% yield, it means that there's an 8% tax equivalent. Remember that chart we showed you earlier? So let's say that 6% really means 8% before the tax advantage or 8% uh, for any other investment that they would have to match that. And there's a global warehouse rate, you know, uh, like the one we talked about before that had a 5% yield and a 7% tax equivalent. Well, what this says is that the if they do the $200,000 there and they get that return rate, the REITs will generate $15,000 of income. All right. So we've taken 200000 of their $1.2 million, and that leaves them a million dollars left to generate the other $20,000 of income, which is only 2%. So really taking uh, the heavy lifting, the REITs taking the heavy lift on the income, helps them relax and say, can I, can I pull out 2% of my million dollars for a while and make that work? And the answer is probably yes, as long as they do a good job uh, behaving on all the other investments. Okay, so the benefits of the decision is that they got their first vacation like they're hoping for. Um, they have non-correlation so that the investments in the REITs will be different than the other investments. The REITs cover 43% of their $35,000 gap. They have tax advantage income and they have other assets to solve for other needs. Perhaps there's long-term care down the road. Uh, they meet, might need cash and some of the other million dollars. So there you go. There's Mort and Betty Gage and the case for them. Okay, number two, here's a younger family. We're gonna go to the other side of it. Some of you are in the thirties. They call the younger family. And there's a, we we'll call this a greater calling. So the situation is this. The dad is a top income producer. Uh, mom is a higher earner as well. Uh, they're great savers, okay? And uh, mom wants to spend more time with the kids now. So the problem of the, uh, the challenge is how do we replace her income? Well, here's one approach again. We invest in dividend producing assets, not REITs, but we, there's other assets that produce dividends out there that are tax advantage. Uh, right now, a very good fund on a dividend producing basis is about 45%, four to 5%. And it's tax advantages, tax at a dividend rate, which is lower for most people. It's at 15% instead of our ordinary income tax rate. So there's that. They can do also a private note. They can do a high dividend large company stock. Okay, they can do a diversified income producing REIT. So there you go. There's different ways to produce the dividends, replace the wife's income. Okay, the benefit of the decision is that there's diversification again, non-correlation a mix of ordinary and tax advantage income. Most people like that, but they don't know exactly how to achieve that. And more time with the kids, most importantly. Okay, last one is a single uh, uh, woman named Broker Bar Barker. I don't know why I made that so tough for myself. She's seeking a hedge and let's see what that means. Her situation is that she's a high income earner. All right, she is 100% in stocks and bonds. So. She can relate to real estate because she sells it. She's a real estate broker. She's broker Barb. Okay. She wants to avoid though active management. She's seen 
how actively managing real estate has been a little bit challenging for some of her clients. She wants to avoid that because she really enjoys just selling the real estate. She has a self-directed IRA account. This is important, okay? And she won't retire for another 10 or 20 years. So here's the thing about Barb. She doesn't need the income, but she wants diversification. The REITs generate income. When they generate income, they are taxed. That's where the SEP IRA comes in. If you, if you put the REIT in the IRA account and it generates the income, it'll simply grow the IRA account balance, but it won't be taxed. So this is a great use of, especially in this situation. So one approach is she uses her self-directed IRA account to make a REIT investment. She splits the REIT investment among three different REITs. So that way she's allocated among the REITs. She has different property types. One REIT is perhaps opportunistic or is aggressive. She can take a little bit more chance on that, a little more risk reward on that. The benefits are that she got diversification and the non-correlation. It satisfies her anxiety around being too concentrated, too, she wanted that hedge. So it satisfies the anxiety about being too concentrated in stocks and bonds. Uh, real estate is an income that's tax of, uh, deferred in her IRA account. And she's got a long time horizon. That three to nine years will work out perfectly for somebody who will retire in 10 to 20 years. And by the way, this is really important. She can also use this as an example, as a test on REITs before she retires. Because when she retires, then maybe she would want to buy some REITs in her taxable accounts. And that way, that income will be tax advantage. All right. So those are our examples here. Uh, I'm going to skip this one here. Uh, the buy or sell thing. I'm going to leave this to all the good folks on here. Here's my contact information. Don't abuse it, <laughs> but use it if you need. Happy to, happy to help out and be a, a traffic cop on your questions. All right, let's go back to um, your questions then. Go ahead and okay. stop sharing. Okay. There are um, a number of questions about where should they do research to find a good REIT or to research more in depth a particular REIT? And how do you determine as you're doing your research if it's a high quality REIT? Let's see, there's a couple of different questions. Let's tackle them in order. One is uh, how do you uh, do your research? Um, it depends on uh, which direction you decide to go. If you decide to go on, on a traded REIT, where it's available on the exchange, you can buy it on Schwab, that sort of thing. There's lots of research out there for these REITs. So in fact, they actually give ratings and they compare REITs. So there's a lot of uh, data out there. You can do that through your platform that you're on, whether it be Fidelity or whatever it is. Um, so there's lots of resources that way. That's taking your research. I would use my grid that I created earlier as a, as a, as a baseline for the sort of things to look for when you do your research. So put those two together and you're probably an, uh, off to a good start. In terms of the non-traded REITs, uh, the suggestion, those are harder to get because because they're non-traded, uh, that means that they have to go through a financial advisor who is authorized to sell them. Not all the advisors out there are licensed uh, or have the licenses to sell these non-traded REITs. Uh, they're not commissioned. They can be commissioned. They can be fee. So it's not about fee and commission. It really is about having the licenses to do that. That person would have the information that you would need for that. Because if they're non-traded, that means that they have to go through that filter. You can go ahead and look for non-traded REITs and do some research and you get some done on the web through the websites of those REIT companies themselves. But probably since these are generally gonna be purchased from an advisor, you might wanna establish a relationship with uh, an advisor like that and then uh, ha let them know what their goals are, try to match up your goals and what they have and then go from there. And they'll kind of streamline it for you and get you all of them. But in the very end, with those non-trader REITs, you get a lot of information. You get the prospectus. There's a lot of material in there. It's probably more than you would expect. And certainly it'll check all the boxes. So that's how you do that. Uh, how do you end up with a higher quality REIT? You know what? I think what you look at is you look at a couple things. Um, the one is the property type they invest in. Uh, second is the management team. There really is a big a difference in management teams out there. They're not all the same. And the third is the uh, experience the track record of the fund manager because they have more like me more than just that one fund that they're offering they've had other ones and they've had other funds go through full cycles so you can look back and see on their track record uh how they've done and how they've weathered the tough uh times 
and if they had a bad year or two or three, I think the question is, is, uh, you know, to learn more about what happened during that time, because just because it was bad doesn't mean it was a bad manager or bad fund. It could have been just a bad period for that asset uh, property type. So I think that gets, I think that answers most of that question, Nancy. Yeah, definitely. Um, and you kind of answered this too, but can, can REITs sometimes result in um, a passive activity loss? Um, yes, they can. Yes, so uh, uh, on a read, a passive activity loss would be that you lose, let's say you buy it here, $10 a share, you sell it at $8 a share. Most definitely, it's like any other investment. If you sell it at eight, you got $2 a share loss times the number of shares you have, and you would write that off against other passive gains that you would have. Okay, um, and then another question, um, are there state tax advantages to REITs? No, there's not. Um, one thing I don't know um, is I don't know the impact of QBI to each state. So I don't know. I want to carve that out and say, ask your tax person for that. But otherwise, there's no tax advantage. They're not like muni bonds where they're, they could be good or not, not usable in the state that you're in. Not the same with the REITs. Okay. And then um, someone directly asked for if you have a suggestion for um, a, re a traded REIT mutual fund. Um, you know what, I don't have a recommendation for that person, um, but I do have a, a, a fund that I, I've been looking at for a while now. They have a good track record, but I would, I would encourage this person, this is not advice for them and not a recommendation, but I would encourage them to look into it more and talk with their advisor, their tax person and so on to see if it's suitable because it could be not suitable at all. But I like the Conan Steers uh, sh Realty Shares REIT um they uh, you'll see uh, when you go back actually through even through covid uh they did a, did a decent job there's a lot of good traded reits out there that they can get i like that one that's a good place to learn and then decide to pick work with your professionals to figure out which one you want to eventually go to that's a freebie there you go excellent thank you um and i believe we've covered all the questions Wow. Okay. Okay, folks. Um, thank you very much, uh, San Francisco Library, for allowing us to cover this topic and spend time with your membership. And um, oh, how do you spell Conan and Steers? Uh, your recommendation, your uh, read. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now that he's, now that this person spells it that way, um, C O N. A N steers S T E E R S, and if you have and, it's, and the fund is Realty Shares, they have several different funds. They've been around for I think over 40, 50 years. But um, if you yeah, Conan Steers, thank you, Elizabeth. That's the one. C O H E N. That's what was throwing me off the Conan. I think of Conan O'Brien for some reason. Mm -hmm. But C O H E N is the right spe uh, spelling. Thank you. So I think that's it. I'm almost embarrassed that we're done early. <laughs> so okay Lori, is there anything else on our side that you need no thank you so much rich and thank you nancy we really appreciate you taking the time to share with us your professional expertise and thank you everyone for joining the program i hope you find the presentation informative um, we'll send out the evaluation survey together with the slide deck and the link to the recording later this afternoon and please give us your feedback so we can continue to improve again thank you everybody and have a wonderful afternoon take care Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.